Welcome to another episode of Investing in IP with David. Today we have a very special guest with us. This gentleman has taken the popular game Paddle Ball and the popular game Spike Ball and combined them into a hit game Paddle Smash, which has been featured on Shark Tank. Please help me welcome Tim Swindle. Hi, David. How's it going, Tim? Good. You hear me? For having me. Yes. Oh for, oh, for sure. I know we were talking a little bit offline here, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to this interview just because it has some, it got some twists and turns that you typically don't don't see. Uh, especially, I would imagine, even from being on Shark Tank uh, and and being able to do deals with uh, Mark, and I, I think what Rob was the other other shark. Uh, but then mm-hmm. also to have to, to be a part of it, a, a, a company who someone else invented the product and then you guys were just able to work with them and partner with them and help, you know, essentially take things to the next level. Uh, I know you have a partner, Scott here, who isn't with us, uh, but going back to the beginning a little bit, can you maybe explain like your background before, I guess we get off into paddle smash. Sure. So I, I was a, uh, a software entrepreneur. I was working on building a, a software startup, uh, it was basically a sales software and was doing that for a couple of years with some guys that I went to school with. And as like a side hustle passion project, I decided to um, create a board game, like a physical tabletop board game uh, akin to like Cards Against Humanity, if you're familiar with Cards Against Humanity. Um, And it was this kind of silly concept of uh, where you say funny phrases and silly accents. It's, it's, it's kind of like a drinking game. I'll just say it that way. <laughs> and um, much to my surprise, this passion project that I, I launched it on Kickstarter, uh, we had like a modest goal that we hit, but you know, it was our first kind of success and win. Um, and from there, it ended up getting picked up by Target and some mm-hmm. other bigger major retailers. And it just kind of took off. Uh, so you know, this was a very different business than I was building as the software company, which was venture backed, high burning cash company, running big teams, uh, very stressful. And then there was a bootstrapped company that I decided to do in my spare time. Um, that was more of like a lifestyle business, but it was very fun and uh, ended up also doing quite well. And so I was like, you know what? That's a lot more fun <laughs> to do. You know, something that I own basically all of, and I like just being in the game space. I like creating things that are bringing fun to the world. I think there's enough out there that's trying to suck the fun out of life these days. And so I was like, you know what, if I can have that be part of like my mission is to bring fun things to the world and, you know, hopefully make some money while I'm at it. Um, that's, that's what I want to do. So uh, I ended up building up that company. Um, had a few different uh, games that I launched under that brand and then ultimately sold it to a big private equity backed toying game company called play monster. And um, from then on, uh, I also ended up selling the, excuse me, the software company to LinkedIn. And so that kind of freed me up and uh, said, you know, I, I I could choose my path at this point and I kind of want to stay with that, um, the toying game space. I really enjoyed doing that. and, And that's what I'm doing. Nice, nice. So would you always say even from, I know we talked a little bit about, uh, I guess, the back and forth between uh, the Illinois and uh, Michigan State and uh, the the whole Big Ten thing there. But I guess as you were going through college, did you always think to yourself, I'm going to be an entrepreneur? Because it seems like, at least especially early on, a lot of of the stuff uh, was entrepreneurial or did things just kind of, I guess, go that way or just turn out that way, even though it was uh, unexpected? Yeah, my dad was an entrepreneur. And so that's, I guess, what I kind of saw growing up. Uh, I didn't, I didn't necessarily, well, here's the thing. I I guess I did in the back of my mind, always want to work for myself. Uh, I go back to when I was, gosh, I was probably like 12 years old. And I had launched uh, at this little golf course, like this little nine hole dirt track golf course that I grew up on. Um, I put some business cards and flyers together to offer golf lessons to little kids. And I was only like 12 at the time, really? but, uh, and, and, and really not that good of a golfer to be able to teach anybody. <laughs> but, um, I just remember that as like my first kind of foray into being an entrepreneur and kind of running my own business. And 
you know, scheduling the, the, the lessons and having to, at the time I did in the summers, I'd have to like leave the beach and go get on my golf clothes to go meet the people at the golf course and things like that. So a lot of responsibility and things like that that I learned through that process. And um, yeah, so I think I always wanted to. And, you know, my first jobs out of college were um, just normal jobs, I'll say. And, I, and there's something about I turned 30 and I wasn't married, didn't have kids. And I was just like, you know what? It felt like if I if I don't do this now, yeah. in terms of take the leap into do, doing my own thing, being an entrepreneur, I, I may not ever do it. And and I remember making that kind of conscious decision. And that's when I um, did the software company with those guys uh, that I mentioned earlier. And that just kind of put me on that path that I'm on today. No, and that's that. I think that's a very good point. It seems like uh, a lot of people hit that uh, point in time where once you start having a family where there's a spouse and kids start coming along and obviously we know kids are expensive. Uh, and some of those things that you maybe wanted to do, a lot of times you end up kind of putting those on the shelf. And uh, unfortunately mm -hmm. it seems like those never get off the shelf, which uh, man, I, I always kind of think about that as far as kind of going through life, this one life we have and uh, just being able to kind of say, at least I kind of try whether or not I failed or not. At least I tried to do some of those things that I always wanted to do. In your case, it seems like it kind of worked out perfect because uh, you actually had a lot of success at those things, uh, which it seems like not a lot of people are able to do as far as building up a company and selling them, selling different parts to uh, just other parent companies or equity uh, funds and then just really being able to free up their time and kind of create this whole thing where now, I'm sure right now, you're just doing things that you are uh, what you want to do and maybe you always had a passion for instead of having to do something because you're trying to pay the bills. Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, we're talking about the, we're, we're talking about the hits here, you know, um, I've had things that haven't gone as well. Um, so yep. I think that's an important lesson also is that keep taking swings, you know, failure, um, doesn't mean you can't be successful. It just means you got to keep trying. And, uh, so that's just one thing I'll, I'll note that, uh, I, I did, uh, I did fortunately, you know, with my first couple ones, get some wins. So I knew it was possible, but, uh, since then, I've had things that haven't gone as well. So, um, yeah, not not everything I do turns to gold. I just want to make that clear uh, as we're talking here. Um, and then to your to your other point, what was the other thing you mentioned? Um, yeah, about like choosing my path, kind of like thing, and doing working on things that you know I want to. That that is something that I I do focus on and think about a lot. Of like, yeah, like our time is precious. I do have a young family now. Um, and I do want to, I want to work on things that I enjoy doing and that I want to bring things to life that I, I enjoy. Right. So if, if, uh, my, my, my thought process there is like, even if this isn't successful, not from the money standpoint, you know, do I, am I going to feel good about having tried to bring this to life, you know, and, and that's kind of my litmus test as I decide on which projects to work on. No, yeah, for sure. And uh, yeah, I definitely maybe didn't want to make it seem like, hey, just everybody quit their job, go be an entrepreneur and things are going to work out perfect. Uh, I know, you know, I know we we're talking offline about uh, Dan Klesner, who I interviewed a, a, a month ago and just kind of being in that same industry with you know, the toy and game industry. And yeah, mm -hmm. that seems like it's, it's, a, it's a rough industry just from, uh, from talking to him in terms of just having to continue to keep swing, uh, keep swinging the bad and uh, you know a lot of the stuff end up maybe not working for whatever reason, one reason or another. But uh, when you get a chance to have something works, uh, then uh, it, it seems like it at least keeps you going. Uh, so, but but it's, it was it's interesting because you, you said earlier on that you always wanted to, or not always wanted to, but preferred kind of doing things where you were maybe kind of in charge as opposed to having to kind of share ownership and 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 whatnot with other people. Uh, but then with the company that you guys have pedal smash and just roping in your partner, Scott Brown, who's not here today. What made you say, okay, I want to kind of do this with somebody else as opposed to, okay, I'm going to just do this on my own. So I met Scott when we were both living in Chicago at the time. And I created that board game that I mentioned before. It was called utter nonsense. And after I did that initial Kickstarter, uh, I was introduced to Scott, who had founded a uh, series of retail shops called Marvel's The Brain Store. And it was like a toy and game retailer who carried games. And 
So I was introduced to him. We were both living in Chicago and he ended up carrying my game at his stores. And that's kind of how we got to know each other. So it was, you know, through that kind of working relationship. Um, but we did ultimately be kind of become friends through that as well. And uh, while both of us, you know, were in separate careers, so to speak, uh, and building his retail companies, I was building a board game brand. Um, we ultimately both sold our companies and um, just decided that we wanted to work together. We just, we, we hit it off, got, worked well together, had different skill sets. He's much more like creative design um, focused, and maybe a little more like back end operations, nuts and bolts. So kind of like front of house, back of house um, type of a you know, working relationship. And yeah, the, I mean, my point about being an entrepreneur is like, you don't have to do it yourself. There's difference between having a business partner and having a boss. Yeah. And so I guess that's like the key difference there was like, I didn't want to just like be another corporate guy, you know, with, that was trying to make my way up the ladder. Yeah. But having business partners, I think is something I've done it both ways. And I, I see a lot of benefit in having a business partner, at least one, you know, at least, if not two, there's, um, while I'm intrinsically motivated, I think it's, it's great to have someone who also like you're responsible to. And so it's like different, you know, if I say I'm going to do something myself, um, by next week versus if I tell somebody else, I'm going to do something by next week. Like if there's more, you're going to, you're going to do it because you committed to that person. Right. Um, sure. and just to, like bounce ideas off, et cetera. So, yeah. So Scott and I, uh, so do you want me to get into the kind of story? Oh yeah, of, oh, yeah for sure. And, it, and even before saying that, it seems like kind of you guys typically fit the mold, which always seems to work well together when you have somebody else who compliments you. I know I, I interviewed, uh, 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 two guys uh, maybe a couple months ago who they are on their second invention now, which is a uh, magic shower to wash pets. Their first invention was oil udder to change uh, oil for cars. Uh, but it seemed like they knew each other growing up and one had an engineering uh, background. So he was kind of more so, uh, I, I guess the way he thought was different from his, his buddy who was an advertiser and had that advertising mm -hmm. background. So it seems like in those cases where you're not just doing, you have two engineers are trying to start a company and, Maybe they don't balance each other out as well. I'm not saying they can't work, but it seems like having that situation where, okay, you have maybe a partner and they're able to kind of see your blind spots or add value in ways that uh, you wouldn't wouldn't have been able to maybe kind of do on your own seems to always be uh, helpful, at least when uh, you are maybe deciding to pick a partner uh, if, if in that case uh, with the business. I think so. I think it's better to have complementary skills than, sure. you know, two of us are like, let's say very good at engineering, but none, none of us have like a marketing focus. Like, you know, to me, I think that does make a lot of sense. Uh, it's, it's best. You think about any of the best teams, right? I mean, it's like, yep. um, I'm not a big Bulls fan, you know, back in the day with Michael Jordan and Scotty Pippen and um, Steve Kerr and uh, just Dennis guys Rodman, like okay. De De Dennis Rodman, like they all have different, very different skill sets that work well together as a team cohesively and i think it's the same concept in, in business for sure for sure even phil jackson brought something different to the table as a coach uh mm -hmm. so so then who, who ended up uh because again this story is different in terms of typically you'll see a team invent something maybe from scratch or whatnot but it seems like uh you guys and we'll talk about the whole licensing thing uh as we get off into it uh who, who met Joe Bingham, who obviously, at least I'm assuming, had the patent or invented the actual game Paddle Smash. Yeah, so so Scott and I were mulling around on different ideas that we wanted to pursue. Scott's a huge pickleball player, and pickleball is the fastest growing sport in North America. It's just exploding. And um, we didn't want to do just like another paddle or ball variation or net or, or apparel. I don't know. It just seemed like everyone was kind of doing the same thing, trying to reach on to that space. So we'd already kind of highlighted that something in the pickleball realm was something, you know, we wanted to pursue. And shortly after having those conversations, Scott, who now lives out in, in Utah, uh, was introduced to Joe Bingham, the inventor of Paddle Smash through a mutual friend. Um, and he, Joe is a uh, dad of seven kids, six of them boys. He's a structural engineer by trade. And the whole family used to love playing spike ball. Um, now the whole family is really into pickleball. 
And like a lot of people right now, pickleball courts are always crowded. They're just like wait in line. In his case, they were like 20 minutes away, the courts. So he was like, I want to come up with something that we can just play in the backyard. And he didn't have whatever it is, 25 grand to build his own pickleball court. So he's, he's an engineer, as I mentioned by trade, he's just a good, he's a tinkerer. You know, he's got all the equipment in his garage or whatever, uh, CNC machines and routers or whatever. And he created this prototype of what is now Paddle Smash and play tested it again, tinkered around with it to kind of perfect what the, the, the dimension should be in the gameplay, but didn't really know what to do with it. And uh, that's when Scott met him and uh, he was like, hey, what if, you know, Scott played it, loved it. Um, I flew out. I played Joe's prototype. We took it to some local pickleball courts to check it out, try to get some people that we didn't know just to come play it. Kind of like an immediate just you could see the reaction of like people were like this is really cool. This is like I, when can I buy this? You know they're trying to buy the prototype. Really? So it just gave yeah it, it gave us the confidence that like this is something we wanted to pursue. So you know in that scenario, there's a couple different ways you could skin the cat. Joe didn't want to be involved with the day to day operations, of the business. He didn't you know skill set. Let's just say to kind of like okay. build the business from there. Um, and so Scott and I did a licensing agreement with him. Um, so it's a royalty that he collects quarterly based on sales of the game. And, and that's the arrangement that we have with Joe. And so uh, at the time, Joe did not have um, the patent on it, though. We actually I applied. I about that. Yeah, so we, we applied for that ourselves. Um, we are currently patent pending. We should find out here hopefully soon. Um, we've got some favorable responses, uh, you know, based on like the early indications. Okay. And um, so th that was kind of interesting because because Joe was the inventor, we had to like do he had, he had like sign over the rights or something like that for us to be able to secure the patent. Yeah, assignment exactly. Um, which was, you know, all, all in the up and up. And, and it's a great relationship that we have with Joe. And because um, it's expensive to file for the patent, as you, as you know. Yeah, look, not, yeah, um, that's, yeah. That's what people all the time that uh, this stuff is not a, it's not a cheap thing. You're going to spend, uh, say, just for one patent application to file it, maybe six, seven, eight grand, depending on how yeah. complex it is. Uh, it can be more than that. Uh, maybe it can be a little less. But then when you're talking about prosecuting it and, uh, yeah, yeah, that's a whole other. Yeah, responding yeah, to those office actions. That could be and another. Inter yeah, office actions, right? Like if they have comments, you got to put the whole, you know, uh, brief back to them about, you know, yep. justifying your point. And then in international also is that that's coming into play for us now. And for sure, you know, for sure. So, yeah, just with the US, you can be well over 10 grand just for one application. But if you're talking about filing mm -hmm. a PCT application or Filing these uh, patent applications in different countries, whether it's China, Japan, whatever the case may be, yeah, you're yeah. Uh, that's yeah, that's a whole nother ball game. So, so this is interesting. So you guys, uh, he he almost had this thing, and he just seemed like I don't want to say shelved it, but he didn't. He he wasn't pursuing it from a business standpoint. Joe, I'm talking, and then it seems like mm -hmm. uh, Scott had a mutual maybe Joe and Scott had a mutual friend that whatever who thought that Scott. Would, would I guess be interested in it? Was that kind of how that, uh, mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, Scott's in that space. He's an entrepreneur okay. in the joining game space. And this guy, uh, I think it's Joe's brother-in-law. Uh, yep. I just know Scott personally. It was like, Hey, you know, my brother-in-law, Joe's got this game. We play it at family parties. He doesn't really know what to do with it. You know, it's just one of those stories. Um, and, and it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's also not easy to launch a product. It's very different to invent versus like publish something. Uh, he had no brand around it. The version he had was not something that was mass producible. We had to take that higher design and engineering firm to create a version that was mass scalable, lightweight, portable, um, you know, all these things that we need in order to actually take it to market. So there's about a year um, and probably $50,000 in design and engineering that we did once we had his prototype. I mean, he had like the basic dimensions and things like that, but like we had to kind of break that down into creating what we could then bring to market. Um, and so, 
yeah, and then beyond that, just the the nature of what this game is requires like some very special tooling, uh, which is also very expensive. Uh, the, the tooling that we need, because our, our without describing the game too too much detail, we have this like hard plastic base, and that is an injection molded base. Uh, that's just like a, a a term where they take I think plastic and they push it through a press into a mold to to make it look like you're what you want to have to create that mold is you have to create a tool to do that. And that costs like $50,000. Really? So well, as you can see here, like, it was like off, off the shelf component that they can, uh, a no. mold that they can take off yeah. the shelf. It was a special. Wow. So yeah, custom mold and all that. So there you go. I mean, and then there's the website, all that. So, you know, it's probably a couple hundred grand just to get right. this off the ground. And so, and, and that that all of those steps that I just described are not something that everybody knows how to do also. So yeah, between all that, um, it was better for Joe just to be able to sit back and collect checks. The the now. Yeah. Now that's, and, that, and that's why everyone, uh, that, I guess the goal initially when they kind of do go into this whole invention process or get a patent, they, they want to license it. They are trying to license it and, as opposed to trying to bring it to market, just as you described, mm -hmm. it's so difficult to... Uh, to be able to bring things to market, especially if you don't have uh, not only the experience in doing so, but uh, it's a lot of, you know, I would imagine good days and bad days. So you have to have almost, uh, I guess, the, the the perseverance to be able to kind of take the hits and, and keep going with it. Uh, so I, and I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't say this early on, but can you maybe to kind of describe, I know we, I talked about pickle, a combination of maybe pickleball and spike ball, which uh, maybe I know, obviously, like you said, pickleball is, just exploded. I know I'm a member at Lifetime and they've like ripped basketball courts out to put you know, two or three pickleball courts in every uh, Lifetime facility, it seems like, which kind of shows you how much this game has exploded uh, in terms of pickleball. But this mm -hmm. is a combination of pickleball and spike ball. So can you maybe just kind of general, generally uh, kind of describe what uh, Paddle Smash is? Uh? Sure. Yeah, so our game is a, like we've just been talking about, so it's a we say it's like a love child of, of pickleball and spike ball. So the game is played two versus two. So you and a partner, um, everyone has pickleball paddles and balls. And then the the course, the court that I was just talking about is this kind of a hexagon shaped plastic surface, a hard plastic surface that sits on the ground. And then there's a, a net that kind of goes around it um, up into the air. So you're playing down onto that surface and you're, you're working with your partner to bump, set, and smash the ball uh, into the court and over the net to where the next team comes into play. And they're trying to work together uh, to bump, set, and smash it back into the court and over the net. So that's um, that's the game. That's that's paddle smash. Nice, nice, nice. So then, I, and I as I was looking at the Shark Tank episode, it seems like you know, the initial launch, it was you know, relatively successful. I think, what, in nine months, so the first nine months, if I'm not mistaken, uh, around seven hundred thousand dollars uh that was made off the sale of the game uh i guess what what made you guys decide okay let's let's go to shark tank like how how was that kind of thought process and how, how did that come about so i was actually on it one time before uh with a different product that i did with my niece like five years ago is when oh, really? fid fidget spinners were really popular and we came up with this concept of uh it was called lickety spin and basically you took um candy and put it into a mold to create a fidget spinner that kids could play with so it's like a do-it-yourself kit for kids to make candy fidget spinners oh. and we applied to shark tank went on and getting a deal um but the way it works as many people have heard is that what happens on tv is not necessarily what happens after the fact and um we also never aired so um and I don't know exactly why, but we also, the deal that we made on air didn't follow through. So we didn't air and we didn't close on our deal with the sharks that we met. So um, needless to say, I was like a little miffed oh, nice. by the whole Shark Tank experience yeah. initially. Sure. No, that is so, yep. Yeah. So when we did Paddle Smash, I don't know, we we talked about it, um, but I was like, screw Shark Tank. We don't need them, you know? So... <laughs> Uh, fast forward, it's March of this year. So, uh, March of 2023, we launched in October of 2022. So then whatever, five months later, we're at a trade show in New Jersey and 
everyone and their brother are coming up to us being like, this is great. You guys need to be on Shark Tank. Scott and I wear these like kind of silly 70s style uh, tennis outfits. I saw and, that. Yep. Um, we were wearing the same outfits that we wore in Shark Tank at this trade show. And we heard it from like everyone. And we're just like, okay. And we happen, I was on the way back from there to the airport and I got an email from a producer at Shark Tank asking us to apply. And I was like, you know what, Tim, swallow your pride and your ego. Like mm -hmm. this is this is a really good opportunity if it works out, like just do it. So talked to Scott, we decided to go for it and uh, you know, applied to Shark Tank. It's a pretty arduous process. Right. Um, lots of paperwork and I don't know, interviews and et cetera. And it was about a three month process uh, before we got the nod that we were getting called to go out to LA to shoot in June of this year. So right now we're talking in December of, of 2023. Um, so, you know, we shot the episode in, in June of 2022 in LA and um, it just aired this past October. Um, so, so how was, uh, is the process a little different? Cause I, I interviewed some guys, the turbo trusser, uh, which is a way to, the, the trust of like turkey and chicken and things like that and they were on shark tank actually like you said it's a very arduous process because they had to apply twice i think the first time they said they they essentially got denied and mm -hmm. then maybe several months later later they end up applying again getting the call back but this was maybe around a time of uh they end up doing a deal with kevin o'leary which it seems like it has paid off paid dividends but they end up this was during the time of like covid so they end up i think having to do like a video uh mm. It, he, he was saying that they typically go in to, to kind of to shoot the uh i guess what, what is it the how I, I don't want to say it's a test run but uh the pitch that you give because you have to make a video they said and send it in and but he, mm -hmm. he was saying that in the past you actually had to go they had these little casting cars or whatever you want to call them at different places throughout the country and you have to go there in person and kind of do your pitch to the producers and they decide who ultimately who gets on. Uh, but he said because this was COVID, they had to uh, send a video in. Did you guys have to do a similar thing in terms of send a video in, or uh, to to essentially kind of mm -hmm. on, or did you guys just go in? Yeah, no, we did. Uh, I think because of COVID, they revamped their process. I think it worked out well for them, and they realized they could do basically the whole interviewing process digitally, um, save everybody a lot of trouble and cost of traveling. So. Right. Yeah, everything we did was basically via Zoom um, prior to flying out there. So it was a lot of like Zoom calls, Zoom pitches. Right. Um, we we would record our pitch, Scott and I send it to them. Um, so yeah, it was it was all done remotely and digitally uh, until we ultimately you know went out there and talked to them in person. Nice, nice. So then you're saying that the, was the, the the producer who emailed you? Were they happened to be at the trade show or something, or just they did they just get word of? Uh... They just got word. You know, we were not us personally, but the game was on uh, the Today Show earlier that day, and I think maybe they saw that and just kind of looked into it and 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 saw maybe we had an interesting story or whatever. So that was what we think happened is that, that maybe they saw us be on the Today Show and decided to reach out. Okay. Which, okay. Is, which is unusual, I'll say. I mean, yeah. they do sure. that sp sporadically, but I think typically people are just straight up applying and trying to go through. So I'll say that that helped the cause a little bit, you know, since they had contacted us directly. It's not a guarantee, but I think that there was a little bit of like, they, they helped shepherd us through the process a little For bit. For sure. For sure. Not in, in, in even, uh, it seems like maybe the fact that this had an element of pickleball, which is a fast, uh, like you said, a, a fast growing game. I, I'm sure that maybe also, yeah, that as well. it's, it's, tr it's trendy. Yep. Yeah. It's trendy and it's got a lot of buzz right now and they're, they're there to make ratings and they want, you know, people to watch the show because of, you know, things that are going on in pop culture. So, For sure. um, yep. yeah. Uh, so, so it, it, like you said, I watching the show, it, it was very funny. You guys, you get the, the throwback tennis outfits on. Uh, so then being there the second time around, I would imagine it seemed like it was, Maybe a few sharks that may have still been there. Uh, maybe when you back when you went on the first time. Uh, but I'm assuming there's also some new faces. So, in, in your opinion, how how did you think? Seems like you're a veteran at this point, as far as being in the <laughs> tank and and uh and, and pitching to those guys. I know again, just interviewing the guys from Turbo Trusser, they were telling me like they literally had to stop the episode because I think I think Barb was like, "Hey, this guy's like sweating profusely. Can we get him a, a napkin or something?" To, 
wipe off the sweat. And they were dressed in costumes, like chicken and turkey costumes, which maybe didn't help out. But it, it was still seemed like a, a very anxious, uh, essentially nerve wracking process. How, how was that being in a tank for you, especially since it was your second time? Very nerve wracking. I <laughs> thought, I thought going into it because I had been on it before that it was going to be like not no big deal. Um, it was just I was very nervous. I'll say. Um, I think you know, the first time I was with my 10 year old niece, and I think I was so worried about her that I wasn't worried about the show and being on the show. So now that I was like, just focused on worrying about myself, you know, like I, cause I trusted Scott was going to do what he needed to. Um, I was like in a way more nervous the second time. I don't know how to explain that. Um, but it, it, it was uh, an awesome experience I'll say. And everything about it has been, been great since then. So uh, the, the production team, the Sharks. So again, as, as some people may know, um, not every deal closes after the fact, as I learned the first time. Um, and so that's been the same case with us, even with Paddle Smash. So we did do a deal with, with Mark and Robert, as you mentioned, okay. but uh, we have not you know, since closed on that deal, which is fine. Um, yeah. It just didn't work out for a number of reasons. Yep. And it's uh, no, no, no holds or, you know, no, no hard feelings or anything like that. Sure. Um, yep. we're, we're super uh, happy with the episode and glad we went on it. And it's been a tremendous opportunity for the business. No, oh, yeah, for sure. And I was going to say, yeah, I, I, cause like most people, you would think, okay, you did a deal and it's automatically going to close. But again, just kind of interviewing the guys early on with the turbo trust or that's he, he kind of gave me the numbers and it was like, wow, very few of these things, not only, uh, air the episodes air as you mentioned earlier but even if you do a deal very few of these things it seems like actually close which uh seems like you know, theirs ended up closing and and, and, and what not with Kevin O'Leary but uh it seems like just even still being on the show just having that publicity can be like kind of a, a shock that the the company would need to just kind of get the eyeballs out there and people interested in the product so do you believe that uh that was something that uh, you guys benefited from having been on a show? Hugely. Yeah. I mean, the weekend of it airing, we did basically what we did had done the whole year. I mean, it's like a massive opportunity. You know, they have four and a half million people that watch it. I mean, I think back in the day it was like 9 million. So it's not, it's not nearly the, the size of the show that it used to be popularity wise, but it's still, uh, the, they have a great brand. I mean, it's because it's not only watching the show. Now it's like the streaming services. Yeah. They've got the MSNBC deal. There's reruns. Um, I mean, just last week we did a podcast. So there's all, there's this whole network community around Shark Tank. Yeah. Um, it's like there's it was like the largest Shark Tank focused podcast basically. Really? Um, that we were on last week. So, and then it's just it's like a badge of honor and like you you do reach out to certain people say you're on a scene on shark tank you oh. kind of get the the response rate i'll say has gone up you know from from before we from from before we were on the show so uh, yeah it's it's a really good opportunity so then how do you try to i guess really capitalize in terms of okay not only is just okay we're doing sales maybe for this weekend that it aired, but also try to kind of really parlay that into some, maybe some long-term success. How, how do you guys kind of maybe really try to take advantage uh, of it from that way? Or, or is that something that you guys just don't think about? It's just, uh, just the ass, ass scene on Shark Tank, which obviously helps out, uh, or was it other things that you guys maybe try to do or implement to try to really kind of use that Shark Tank? Uh... Well, it's, it's, it's shifted our, uh, like, um, advertising approach i mean now we lean in heavily to this you know shark tank so yeah there's a ton of people out there that don't watch the show but they're familiar with it and so now if you see like any of our ads on instagram facebook etc um it's likely that it's like a as seen on shark tank type of an ad um so we're leveraging being on the show uh even if people haven't watched it it's still like you know we're, we're leveraging us being on it at one point um, in, in, in different ways. And that's just one example. No, for sure. No, that's good stuff. So then you talked about, uh, uh, you know, international and 
I, I'm not sure. It, it, it's I know pickleball. It seems like in North America, you know, we mentioned it being kind of just have blown up. Up is that kind of similar in like other countries, uh, such as, such as Europe or maybe uh, countries in Europe or China or Japan? How uh, have yeah, that it's, it's 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 not as big in other countries. Okay. Uh, it's it's. I mean, relatively here, nothing's close. Um, the others, there's another sport called padel uh, that is different from pad. There's paddle tennis also, which is different. So it's called padel, and it's played in almost like a glass cage, yeah. like a little mini tennis court. Uh, yeah. That's the best way I can describe it. And that's huge in like Europe and I think even South America. And so. The, that also kind of looks like our court. It's like a miniature version in a way because ours is like surrounded by a net and right. it's like it has elements of it. So it's funny, like when we talk to people in Europe, they're like, this is like a cross between Padel and, and, and spike ball. And um, so we can we can kind of lean into that a little bit. Uh, but pickleball is starting to infiltrate other countries, um, but certainly not nearly as big as it is as it is here. Okay. Okay. So then as you guys branch out and kind of file for protection in other countries uh, from a PAP standpoint, what other uh, countries are you maybe looking to try to uh, extend uh, Paddle Smash and to or look to go into with Paddle Smash? Well, we just did Canada. So we're nice. launched in Canada as of right now. Um, we're launching in Chile in a little bit, nice. uh, a little, little random, but um, we had somebody that was very interested in helping us distribute it there. And so we decided to go for it. Um, all of the EU countries. So nice. that's another one that we're currently working on. We should be in the EU in probably March, April timeframe of, of 2024. Yep. And then we would ultimately like to be in like Australia, New Zealand, um, especially because we have a very seasonal product. Our game is largely played outdoors. So yep. it needs to be warm weather essentially. Um, so uh, it would be nice to be in the Southern hemisphere where they have the different uh, winters than we do. Their so summers are, the, yeah. I was going to ask, so then I'm assuming that right now is like manufactured here in the U.S.? No, I wish. <laughs> um, it's manufactured in China. Yeah. Okay. We, okay. And, and I was going to say that, yeah, that makes sense of the, just in terms of keeping the cost down. Uh, uh, so yeah, it's, you, cost you, and, it's cost and capabilities. I mean, the uh we've tried to, to, to have it manufactured here and um it's it's like a capabilities issue with really? uh yeah the, the us doesn't have this size press we need for that plastic court that i was talking about um it requires this like very large piece of equipment that's a press that pushes the plastic through and there's like one in the us that's in south carolina and unfortunately, like they know it and it's cost prohibitive. Oh, so they try to jack up the price as a result of that. That sucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so then you guys didn't decide to try to get the patent protection in China. I know sometimes uh, people uh, trying to get a bad rep because of whether or not you can protect the invention. I, I know I, I interviewed Nancy Tedeschi. She had a snappish screw that she invented and, and ended up being able to do a license deal with the largest lens distributor in the world. And, uh, since she, she manufactured it in China as well, and she was able to successfully defend uh, versus uh, infringers in China, which uh, she is mm -hmm. very happy about. And, and it seems like, so it seems like things maybe are kind of coming around as it relates to being able to kind of protect your stuff in China or enforce your patent in China. Is that is that something uh, you guys Yeah, have? I don't know. I mean, we you know, because we're more worried about like where our game could be sold and we don't see China being a huge market for us. I think there's, I think I read somewhere where there's no word in Chinese for backyard. I think somebody mentioned that to me. Really? And so, yeah. So like backyard games okay. generally like aren't now they would be infringers in terms of like a lot of the copycats come from China, but they're not necessarily selling the game in China. Right. So I think we're more concerned about people like that are trying to sell in certain markets where we want to be. And that's where we're gotcha. trying to be protected. And, and that's interesting, an interesting way to look at it, because it seems like that that approach was maybe different from hers, because she actually, not only did she get a patent in China, but she got it uh, a patent in, in the EPO or the European Patent Office. And uh, and that was you know, very expensive. I think she said she spent like 40 grand doing that. And she said if she can do it all over again, she would have not done it in Europe. Uh I just did it in China because she said even if they would have 
but she was thinking of, okay, who can manufacture this thing? Because she's like, okay, even if they can manufacture it in Europe for whatever a dollar, I'm still blowing them out the water by being able to manufacture it in China for a lot less than that. So go, go right ahead, manufacture it in, 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 in Europe and sell it. Uh, but essentially, I'm going to be able to uh, 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 sell it, sell my product for cheaper than you're going to be able to sell my product because I'm getting it manufactured in China, which is a lot cheaper than what you, uh, a competitor manufacturing it or st- uh, 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 not even a competitor, somebody who's still in the product who may manufacture mm-hmm. uh, in Europe. So that was kind of her thought process mm-hmm. to the point where she's like, hey, I, if I can do it all over again, I would just do it and get a pan in China because that's where I'm manufacturing. So she was looking at manufacturer where she's manufacturing things at, as opposed to where mm-hmm. she was selling it. Yeah, it's interesting. I've never thought of it like that, but it's something I can probably talk to our patent attorney to see if it makes sense to uh, to to look at getting it secured in in China as well. Nice, 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 nice. So then, in terms of like in the stores, I know you guys are in stores as as we uh uh. I don't maybe look to try to close out here. What are some of the stores? I think when Dick Sporting Goods was one of a big store that you guys were in. Was it any other uh, retail stores that you that that I guess people can find the game outside of maybe going to to the website? Yep. So we are uh, on Amazon. I think most people these days uh, <laughs> like to buy goods is Amazon. Uh, but yeah, we're in Dick Sporting Goods and select stores, Shields select stores. Um, academy sports select stores so you know typically the way that works is they're going to like kind of test run new products before they do full chain you know dick's case they have 750 stores it's rare that they're going to like take take a product and give it to all stores (laughs) um so we're in a test phase with them i think it's going well they've just placed a couple other big reorders so you know we should hopefully be expanding with them next year um, but yeah, our website, paddlesmash.com and, and Amazon are two other great places to, to find us. Nice, nice, nice. And then in terms of some like of the long-term goals for the companies that hey, just continue to operate it or it seems like you've had success uh, and maybe being able to sell some companies uh, in the past. So is that something that you guys would be, maybe interested in doing if things made sense from that standpoint? Or at this point, is it just, hey, you no, know, we're trying to build up the company and and just sell the product and maybe come out with maybe some additional stuff going forward. I think for now it's, it's just grow, the, grow the brand, grow the product, grow the, grow the company. Um, those, those questions about acquisition tend to take care of themselves if, if you execute well. And right. so I think it's, it's not, I don't think it's smart to like go into a business already thinking about the exit. Um, I'll, I'll say that yes, have, have we considered who may be a potential acquirer for us down the road? Like, yes, um, there's plenty of like sporting goods companies or other big sports equipment companies that, you know, would like to have a hit on their hands as well. Um, so that day may come, but uh, unless we execute, unless we perform, unless we grow, um, that's likely not going to happen. So, right. you know, sure. that's all we're, that's all we're focused on right now. Nice. Nice. And that makes perfect sense. So how, how can, I guess the audience follow, Paddle Smash, I follow you guys. I know uh, you guys have the, the website. Do you guys have any social media that uh, they can go to if they want to follow uh, or maybe even kind of look to purchase one? I know Christmas time is coming up here. Yeah, so we're on Instagram. Uh, that's probably our main channel on TikTok. We've actually gone viral on TikTok a couple of times, which is really? funny. Um, so I'm not on TikTok, so I find it fascinating. There's one, one video has like 15 million views, uh, which is just wild. Um, but yeah, so Instagram, TikTok, um, Scott and I are both on LinkedIn and people have questions. Uh, and then obviously the website, battlesmash.com, you know, we'd be able to get a hold of us as well. So yeah, those are, those are the spots where we're, where we're at. Nice, nice, nice. And I guess the one last question that I always try to kind of leave out on, especially, uh, as an entrepreneur, is it any advice that you can give, uh, I guess entrepreneurs out there or someone who's maybe looking to jump into the, the entrepreneur, uh, I guess game, if you will. Uh, as far as that they can kind of take and apply and and, and kind of help them along the way. Obviously, you have had success uh, not only with Paddle Smash, but with some other companies that you have, have had. And for me personally, I always like taking advice from people who have experience doing what it is that I'm trying to do or uh, have had success in, I guess, the lane that I'm trying to have success in as opposed to from a theoretical, looking at things from a theoretical standpoint. So do you have any, I guess, uh, jewels or 
uh, tips for entrepreneurs to be or entre current entrepreneurs that they can take? Get going. <laughs> Get going. I, like I, I talk. I talk to a lot of people who have an idea and want to pursue it, and it's like they'll just talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, but never take any action. And so my advice is like, get going, get started, get a prototype, get something out there that you can test out and see if your idea has any relevance, you know, get it in other people's hands to get that feedback go going. Um, Cause it's like, you know, I'll talk to people, they'll tell me about this idea they have or something and I'll kind of give them some steps. And then it's like six months later, I'll talk to them again. And they're like, yeah, no, still thinking about it, you know? And so um, you got to like, get, you know, put, put a shovel in the ground and, and start digging, get going. No, I like that. Yeah, and that was the whole point. Uh, a big part of the channel is uh, just being able to bring successful companies or successful individuals on such as yourself who, who's had success and uh, kind of be able to kind of share a little bit of your story of kind of how you went about things because everybody's story is a little bit different uh, in terms of, kind of how they went about things and the success that they had. So to be able to kind of bring on these other people and, and hopefully the audience can kind of take at least some of the things that they've learned and that maybe, I don't know, uh, the stories may be similar and if they can apply some things in a way that you guys have to have success. Uh, I, I guess I think that's at least for me the, a big part of the channel. Uh, but hey, if, 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 if you're going to kind of get the all the answers and not do anything I, i'm not sure we can help you all, uh, out with that uh mm -hmm. unfortunately so no well i definitely appreciate it tim for uh, uh talking to uh talking with me here uh, i mean i think this is fascinating and uh hey the paddle smash you guys heard on paddle smash.com uh, i'll definitely once the interview drops uh to make sure to have all the the handles the, the social media handles yeah that the tiktok i i know kind of my content creation guy he he wants me to uh I shouldn't call him that. Essentially, my content creation officer wants me to uh, get get with TikTok, and it just seems like, man, I'm trying to kind of slow down, kind of my ADD, and uh, mm -hmm. like, I know. Know, TikTok is uh, is not going to help out with that. I agree, but there's a lot of people on there, you know. I think their valuations like up near Facebook now or something, but really? um, yeah. But I agree. It's like I've got too many of those. I try, that's one I try to stay away from. I know yeah, it's sure. pretty addictive. But yeah. Well, well thank right. you, David. I appreciate you having me on. No problem. No problem. And until next time, audience, you guys take care.